Let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to today's session. Uh, today we will be hosting the first session of the fourth session of our learning collaborative on health for all, increase inclusion for people with disabilities. And this learning collaborative is provided to you by the National Center for Health and Problem Counseling. Thank you for joining again. This is just a kind reminder to all participants that your line is muted upon entry. Please make sure that you engage in the chat if you have any questions or any comments. And um, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Lombardi, will be providing some additional instructions with regards to our engagements for today later on as well. And this meeting is also being recorded. The slides in the recording uh, for today's session will also be sent to you all via email after today's session. Again, the mission of the National Center for Health and Public Housing is to strengthen the capacity of public housing primary care grantees and other health center grantees by providing a range of training and technical assistance. SHPH is a project supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration. and is a national training and technical assistance partner that is 100% financed by this grant. The information presented today are those of the author only. And today uh, we have um, the same or same NCHP staff, myself. Uh, my name is Philip Pineda and I'm the team manager here at NCHP. So I will be helping and facilitating today's session with all the logistics. Um, also, we have Dr. Kevin Lombardi who will be doing our presentation and uh, part of the engagement uh, activities that we'll be doing as well. And Dr. Jose Leon will also be supporting today's session. And now we'll pass it on to Dr. Kevin Lombardi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time today, and thank you to your, <clears throat> to your service to your communities and for your interest in this very important issue. In our final session today, we will be engaging collectively with data, research, and case studies which outline the clinical and non-clinical realities faced by individuals with different types of disabilities. The system we'll be using is similar to in our previous sessions. We'll be performing a case study review. We'll be looking at some recent data that elucidates some of the details of our practice for patients with disability and how we can empower them in our clinics <clears throat> and review uh, some recent publications as, and resources on the topic. Uh, thank you. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, the, to, of course, this is a learning collaborative, so we want to have as much discussion and interdisciplinary discussion as possible today. Um, the uh, There will be a case study with discussion questions, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the perspectives and recommendations of our colleagues on the call today as we try to have a collective understanding of how we can empower patients with disability in our practice and at our health centers. Next slide, please. And the details of the information provided with you today, of to you today, um, all the data, publications and research in, uh, included in this session have been vetted by myself and my team, including the colleagues present here today. Um, and are linked in the resource tabs. Uh, when you receive this, uh, this slide, you'll be able to take a look at more of the details available. Uh, in particular, the promising practices will have links to research studies, which will allow you to replicate those promising practices in your own systems or have discussions with colleagues regarding those. Um, for those of you who are considering a new practice or program intervention, at your health center. Um, taking a published research on the application of one of those, uh, of a similar program and discussing with that with colleagues, discussing the methodology, discussing the suitability for your health center is a great way to increase your understanding of the topic, um, become better at, at uh, and more effective at creating program interventions and is a, is a, is a good, fun way of engaging in the material, um, something I'd recommend greatly. Uh, next, please. 
Um, so uh, before we start, if we could please, uh, if everyone could please pop in the chat uh, where you're joining for us from and what your role is at your organization, please. And Fide, if we can go to the next slide, and if you all could uh, it, put that information to the chat, it's very helpful for us when uh, considering the diversity of perspectives that we have here. Um, now, the primary focus of today's session will be on improving primary care access for uh, patients with disability, uh, facilitating a strong relationship between patients with disability and their primary care physicians is among the most effective and well studied uh, interventions for improving outcomes in these populations. Primary care can greatly in influence and improve the quality of life for people with disabilities, including those with physical disabilities, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Primary care providers get to know their patients over time. Um, from personal experience, I can tell you that it's among the most rewarding uh, parts of the job. And I can say personally that among the most uh, rewarding and enjoyable clinical interactions and relationships that I have built are with patients that have experienced disabilities or experienced disabilities. It's a great way to be more effective as a clinician and to make sure that and to link your patients to the appropriate and comprehensive care that they need. Um, primary care providers get to know their patients over time making them the best source of more personalized and targeting care that addresses their ongoing total health needs. For the general population, access to and use to primary care has been correlated to greater use of preventative health services, fewer hospitalizations, and fewer emergency room visits, and that relationship is significantly stronger for patients with disabilities who experience even better outcomes when a strong, comprehensive relationship with primary care is established. And I might say that when I say primary care, I don't just mean the clinical relationship between physician and, uh, and, and patient. I, I mean the whole interdisciplinary team, the relationship with the CHW and the patient, the relationship of the nurses and the patient. This is all uh, included in when I mean primary care for the duration of this, uh, this session. But let's look over some data about, uh, about this issue and for patients with disability. Uh, a recent study by United Health indicated that 36% of individuals with disabilities have delayed or missed needed health care in the last year, and almost half have uh, yet to schedule a missed primary or preventative care visit. This is a relationship that has existed for a very long time, but has gotten worse dur during and post pandemic. Uh, regarding the perspective of physicians, 40% 40 40 of physicians were very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care to patients with disabilities, and 56.5% of physicians strongly agreed that they welcomed patients with disability into their practice. Um, it, my personal opinion is that physicians and their associated care teams are very well-trained and able to deal with uh, a variety of issues, including the SCOA issues, needed by patients with disability, and these are primary care physicians. Um, the issue is the barriers to getting the patient into the clinic um, and establishing a comprehensive and long-term relationship. Next slide, please. There are a variety of ways the health centers that um, we speak to and consult here at NCHPH have uh, a variety of programs they've, that have been used uh, to make sure that patients have greater access to primary care. Um, accessible uh, health office locations and facilities often create barriers to individuals with disabilities. For example, office and diagnostic equipment, Oreo lifts, exam tables, scales, and imaging machines may be physically inaccessible while diagnostic devices with light or noise may trigger sensory issues. For patients that experience uh, sensory issues, the healthcare environment can be terrifying to them. So ensuring that they are comfortable and they have a long-term relationship with their primary care provider 
can allow them to be more comfortable and more likely to come in. Um, accessibility, and this is particularly true for, for certain screening issues that um, residents with disability are less likely to obtain than the general population, such as man mammograms, annual checkups, and regular dental cleanings and exams. These can be particularly difficult for residents with disabilities. In 2020, 5.8 million people delayed getting medical care in the US because they did not have transportation. Those with a functional disability are more likely to experience transportation barriers. And this can be more severe in rural areas and places that without public transportation infrastructure. Excuse me. Sensitivity or sensory issues is a major concern for, for a variety of individuals with disability or types of disabilities. The healthcare environment can be busy, noisy, and bright, contributing to sensory overload for anyone. For those who have a disability related to their sensory processing, this can be overwhelming, can lead to panic attacks, fear, and um, a, a generally uncomfortable experience in the primary care setting. Uh, this is particularly true with people with for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This can impact their ability to engage in their care or even remain in the setting to receive healthcare services. Um, communication set challenges are also a persistent issue that healthcare health centers um, are attempting to overcome. Both patients and caregivers of pa of uh, individuals with disability reported challenging challenges communicating with healthcare providers, assessing, accessing medical information, and understanding policies they were being asked to consent to or con instructions they were being provided to. Some reported that uh, practice staff and cl clinicians often lack disability etiquette. Um, ensuring that your staff is appropriately trained to communicate with individuals disability, with disability and to meet their communication needs is a core competency of providing care to residents with disability or patients with disability. Now let's look at, I have three promising practices here that are very widely used by um, health centers to promote primary care access for residents with disability. Um, one, home visits. Uh, Many health centers have had success using home visits using CHWs and social services personnel. And this is important for several reasons. First of all, for many individuals with disability, they may prefer a home visit for certain parts of their care. Um, the healthcare environment for these individuals can be particularly scary and overwhelming in some cases. And seeing an individual in a home with a CHW or a social service prof prof professional can help to strengthen the relationship make them feel welcomed, and make them more likely to continue to engage with their health center. Um, <clears throat> many patients with disabilities struggle with access to transportation. Providing, programmatically providing transportation to residents with patients with disability is a core competency, and uh, many health centers have utilized local systems to be able to provide that care. Local taxi systems, subsidized transportation or public transportation are all things that should be considered when uh, when promoting transportation to your residents with patients with disability. And finally, home safety set checks. Uh, data has shown consistently that HUD supported individuals with disability are likely to live in homes that do not have the necessary mobility and accessibility uh, infrastructure to provide a safe place to live. Um, these individuals are more likely to experience falls, they're more likely to experience injuries, and for many in individuals, these injuries can be life-changing and life-threatening. Um, for those of you who have uh, experienced in the ER what a hip fracture looks like, um, it is life-changing, it is life-altering, and it can lead to even more severe levels of disability, which can further estrange the patient from society and their environment. Um, this is particularly true for pa red patients with disability who are also older adults or recently discharged from the hospital. Next slide, please.
Now, we'll, to, to ground ourselves in our residents with disability in public housing, um, I performed an analysis of the Health Center Patient Survey to look at the utilization of these services. And what we see is that um, residents of public housing are much more likely to utilize home visits, approximately two times, 2.5 times more likely to re have received a home visit um, by their health center than other patients seen by FQHCs. Uh, residents of public housing are more reliant on home visits than other demographics. And for PHPCs, home visits offer unique opportunities to reach patients, to build relationships, and to perform necessary functions such as navigation and linking to SDOH resources. The home visits is really one of the best places to do this. Um, if, if those, if for those of you who are, are uh, fans of, of anthropology, I'd recommend picking up Foucault's The Clinic. It's an anthropolog anthropological analysis of the health, health center and the power dynamics that patients experience when they are there. When we see a health center, we see a hospital. We see an environment that is built for the provider primarily, for the provider to be able to do their job and to provide resources. This environment is not designed with the, with the patient's um, experience being primary to that. This is particularly true for residents with disability where the healthcare environment can be intimidating, it can be scary, and it can be disempowering if uh, they are not empowered appropriately. Home visits can allow uh, patients to receive care in a place where they have control. And for residents with disability, this can this can be a game changer. Um, this it, it, when performing a CHW navigation or social service analysis of a patient, doing that in their home will give you access to more information because they are more than likely going to be uh, more likely to share information about sensitive or difficult topics than they are in the healthcare setting. And this has been consistently supported uh, by research on the issue. Uh, next slide, please. Because of transportation and mobility issues, many resident, many patients with disabilities uh, prefer receiving their care by home visits or by telehealth. Um, and this is well supported by the data, but health centers often struggle with uh, getting patients to use these services. And uh, from speaking with health centers and reflecting on the data, uh, my understanding is this, a lot of this has to do with health marketing and your patients understanding what is available as far as services and what they can use. Um, for those of you who, have, who are able to provide residents with disability with telehealth or home visitation services, uh, utilizing multi-channel marketing to show that those, those resources are available is extremely and exceptionally important. When advertising these services, use multi-channel marketing, email, phone, text messages, make these patients aware that these, these resources are available for them to use and they are welcome to use it. Every time, when utilizing uh, multi-channel marketing, I used to, I like to think of it as a statistical relationship. For every modality you use, be it email, be it text message, be it phone calls, be it direct mailing, uh, you increase the likelihood that a patient is going to use that service and you increase the likelihood that you're going to improve their access to care. Um, so my, my system that I, 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 I use when consulting health centers is the following. Emphasize convenience. Make it as convenient as possible for the resident or for the patient to access the, the, the resources and to use the resources. Two, reduce stigma for patients often, especially when the telehealth services are related to behavioral health care or disability care, there can be stigma associated with using those resources. Reduce stigma through, um, through your, your channel, mar marketing channel uh, utilization to increase the likelihood that patients will use the resources and uh, increased access to care. Um, next slide, please. 
So now we're going to take a look at a brief case study um, of a patient with disability in the primary care setting who's experiencing barriers to care. And then we're going to look at a, a promising practice related to SDOH care and integration of SDOH care into disability care. So I'm going to go ahead and read the, the, the case study, and then we'll have an open discussion on the issue. Mr. Sue is a 67-year-old man who presents for a wellness exam. He has a past medical history of spinal cord injury with paraplegia, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and hypertension. The patient has a behavioral health history of major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. Mr. Sue utilizes a wheelchair for mobility. He has not seen his primary care physician since 2018 and does not have medical insurance. The, medic the patient undergoes a standard intake, including vitals and an SDOH screener. The results are as follows. We see the patient is hypertensive with a, a blood pressure of 188 or 98, very close to a hypertensive urgency. Heart rate of 98, respirations of 18. As the providers, we look at the last records available in our system, which are 20, from 2018, and we see the patient's vitals were largely were very good. His BP was controlled at 130 over 98, his heart rate is 60, and his respirations were 18. Hemoglobin A1C was 7.0, which is within criteria for type 2 diabetes, but um, uh, as far as the range of uh, A1Cs that are typically seen in the primary care setting is not very bad. Prescribed medications include metformin, thiazide diuretic for hypertension, and an SSRI for uh, depression and anxiety. Next slide, please. Now, at this primary care provider, SDOH screeners are a core part of the intake, and I would recommend for all of you who uh, are in the primary care setting to utilize SDOH screeners in the intake process. This is a recommendation supported very well by the literature and it provides significant benefits to the health center in networking patients to care. But let's look at Mr. Sue's. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at Mr. Sue. Um, uh, so it seems in the past two months, Mr. Sue has been skipping some meals. He is worried that he might be homeless in the future. He's having difficulty paying for his utilities. And he's having trouble finding a ride. He does not have any child care needs. Next slide, please. He is unemployed. He notes that he does need help finding another job. Notes that he does not need help with education. He does not have concern about someone at home using drugs or alcohol. And he notes that he feels unsafe in his daily life, but also that no one at home is threatening or abusing him. Let's take a moment to reflect on the answers of this patient. Next slide, please. Now you, the provider, are seeing Mr. Sue in the exam room. Mr. Sue is treated by his provider. Upon physical examination, Mrs. Sue, Mr. Sue is noted to be withdrawn and exhibit closed body languages. His physical examination is positive for one plus pitting edema and darkened skin around the neck and groin area, uh, which are signs of uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. New results are positive for HbA1c of 8.2, which is significantly higher than 7.0. And I, I do need to remind folks, for those of you who aren't aware, or uh, that uh, A1c is a logarithmic um, measure. So uh, 8.2 is not uh, is much much higher as far as quantity uh, a, 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 than a 7.0 is an A1c. It is a logarithmic measure. Uh, his his Depression screen is also positive. When questioned regarding the results of his SDOH screener and exam, Mr. Zhu reveals the following. Mr. Zhu was a victim of a car accident in 2004 that resulted in a severe lumbar spinal injury. Mr. Zhu previously had a remote job as a cybersecurity analyst. 
He was laid off eight months ago. Mr. Su was previously receiving unemployment, which ran out 60 days ago. Mr. Su lives in HUD supported housing and is currently 90 days late on his rent. This is a HUD voucher he receives. Mr. Su cannot drive and is consistently struggles to gain access to transportation, including to get to this health center and to purchase food. He previously utilized an electric automated uh, mobility device, which has since broken. He now, uh, he now uses a self-propelled -propel wheelchair. Mr. Su is single and does not have family in the area, and he's been taking a half dose of his medications. Mr. Su is asked if he's interested in assistance for his SDRH issues, including housing, housing instability. But note, he doesn't like doctors, which is a very common thing you hear as a doctor, by the way, that people don't like doctors. Uh, we learn not to take it personally. Uh, when questioned, he notes that he prefers to deal with his private life by himself. When asked why, he notes that in the past, he has had difficulty connecting with providers and has felt judged, which is a very common report from patients. Next slide, please. So I'd like to take five minutes and consider the following. What SDOH issues provide the greatest barrier to primary care for Mr. Su? And how can we ensure that Mr. Su can build a relationship with his primary care provider and health center? We're gonna take five minutes. Uh, during this five minutes, FIDE will slowly scan through the, um, uh, the uh, slides. I will put the questions into the chat so you have access to them. And please consider and provide a response to this in the chat. And I will start the timer now. And Fide, you can go ahead and do that and I will put the, the, the uh, text into the chat so everyone can see. And thank you for considering this patient and for your response.
Okay, we're gonna wait another two minutes, then address our responses and discuss the patient. Okay, Fide, I think that's that's good for now. Um, do you think we could, um, uh, you could do your thing, please? Of course. Um, so I do see that we received some responses in the chat, and I will go ahead and unmute your line so that you can just elaborate a little bit more on your responses. So um, Valerie Canino, would you like to participate? Um, yeah, sure. Good afternoon. Uh, Valerie, if I could uh, please interrupt you before you start. Oh, sure. one, can we call you Valerie? And, um, and sure. Could you please tell us um, what you do? So I am, am at a affordable housing site for 62 years and older, and I am a community care coordinator in this in this building fabulous thank you for your service uh could could you give us some perspective on the transportation barrier that a patient like mr sue is experiencing so it it seems that um that is one of his primary barriers and in my past um work experience i have been a home visitor and I know the benefits of being a home visitor. Um, so that's why I, I put that as, you know, if you can't give him um, resources for transportation, which is something that we actually do here, um, then definitely maybe connecting him with a visiting physician, a visiting social worker, that could be beneficial to him. Now, Valerie, you mentioned that uh, you know well the uh, the benefits of of uh, home visiting, and 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 uh, we know from the data that it's very well supported as an intervention. But what's been your experience? What are what are the benefits that you've seen in your practice? The same things that you mentioned is you get to see the real deal, whereas when your client has to come to you, you're not seeing the full picture. And they're in their natural environment. So they're going to be more at ease in most cases, a little bit more comfortable once you build that relationship. So um, I, I know that it's beneficial because I, you know, that was, I was mandated to do visits for home visits for many years. So it can be dangerous dangerous you know for the you know for the worker for the for the professional but um beneficial to a client who has you know who has barriers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now you mentioned the safety issues um there are a variety of safety issues for home visits mm -hmm. um, and it's very important to make sure that staff that are doing home visits have the appropriate support and training to be able to do it and to do it safely. But have you ever experienced a safety issue yourself? Um, no. And one of the strategies that um, I used in my last role was that we would partner up. So mm. a worker was not, you know, we weren't 
we didn't have to go to a visit by ourselves. We were able to partner up if we needed to, if we knew that the address was, and mind you, I'm in Chicago. Okay. I'm in Chicago. So there you go. It may be a little bit different for someone in another, in a smaller rural community. I don't know, but in the city of Chicago, safety is an issue. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the strategies that we would use. Um, um, I was taught early on to do visits as early as possible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for different reasons. I don't want to take too much of your time, but you don't want to wait until three, four o'clock in the afternoon or when people are up and you know what I'm saying? You try to go as early as possible. So we would use that strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you for that. And thank you for your service to your community, Valerie. Um, if I will, could share my own experience, uh, I worked in pre-hospital medicine for years prior to medical school, and in a in a uh, urban area that had uh, some safety issues uh, uh, in Lynn, Massachusetts, there were a variety of safety issues for our home visits. Yeah, um, and the way that we would uh, would manage that was by working very closely with uh with with law enforcement and fire uh the fire department to ensure that um that uh, we had easy access yes. and we had support when we were there um mm -hmm. so thank you so much for your for your comment and for your service thank you um fide could we um could we pick another uh random answer for sure thank you um rebecca Ibarra. Rebecca, so good to see you today. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Um, I, I, so uh, we 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 know who you are here at NCHPH, but um, could you introduce yourself to the group and tell us what you do? Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca Ibarra. I am a certified community health worker in rural Florida. Excellent. Um, thank you for your service. And it, could you? Tell us a little bit about, um, uh, give us a little more details to your response. I see you're mentioning a variety of issues here. Um, right, so um, when I get a case similar to this, um, the first thing I do is I address the immediate needs. Food and his medication are sometimes his immediate needs. Um, we are lucky enough in our area that we have a number of churches that have pantries and um, they, at least two of them do deliver. So, you know, we could set it up where they could um, address some of those. Uh, we have the Hardy Help Center that also helps for emergency rental assistance or light assistance that we could put in an application for that. And of course, his medication, we have a, for lack of a better term, kind of a medication pantry um, in the county over that can, um, does help assist with, um, you know, providing medications for um, people in need. So those would be what I would do first. Um, our next thing, knowing that he has medical anxiety, knowing that he has, um, some issues uh, we would kind of work with, and I've had some success with some of my other patients, uh, is giving him the tools to manage some of that medical anxiety, that stress. Um, and then my partner, Wendy, who um, I guess she she's, uh, I would pass him off to Wendy because um, over the years we've kind of, developed our strengths in our community where um you know she is very good at looking at those insurances looking at medicare um disability those kinds of things and she's very good at um attending um patients with their uh uh to their doctor's appointments and helping them in those ways, which I do it too, but I tend to stick more with those that need a translator or with children. So we've kind of specialized our area of care. Um, so we've gotten very good in those areas. So um, I don't reinvent the wheel. 
I just find someone who's better at it than me. So at this point, once we've addressed immediate needs, I would get him over to Wendy so that she could provide a more in-depth care. Fabulous, fabulous. Now, if I could follow up with a question, um, as a physician, um, uh, CHWs are uh, a indispensable uh, uh, colleague for building the relationship with the patient. Um, and from my own experience, they, they seem to always like you guys more than they like us. Uh, and uh, my question for you is when you're you're dealing with these patients, when you're talking to them, is there anything in particular you do through interviewing or through your relationship building that helps to build trust in the medical system? Um, you know, and Wendy can jump in on this at any time. She's on this call as well. Um, I guess it's more of the fact that unfortunately, you know, you go to the doctor and they may see a hundred patients in a day and you get them for 15 minutes. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're not doing the work and not putting in the effort. It's just with, you know, you know, so many patients, you get them in one day for 15 minutes where we can take that same information that you gave them and sit down with them and actually review it and say, okay, well, and work with them on how to improve their health. You know, it's um, doctors are the diagnostic tool, I guess you could say, and and that that foundation of this is what's really going on. And then as CHWs, we can sit there and we can spend two hours with them explaining in detail uh, everything that the doctor wants to say, but doesn't have the time. And then when those questions arise, we can go back, we can go back with them to the doctor and ask the questions where a patient may not have the, um, the guts or may not have the, I don't really want to ask this question to the doctor. I don't want to take up their time or, you know, sometimes they feel the patients feel rushed as well and i know that's not the intent but you know you can't you can't always uh make uh you you can't always you know change the way a patient feels and if the doctor's not right for them we just help them find another doctor because that that that's sometimes how life is you just don't get along with someone it is it is and uh, uh, I, dr Lamarie, may i Please go ahead. Sure. Uh, there is something that uh, Rebecca said that is very important uh, in this particular patient, and is the uh, social isolation issue and the um, diagnosis of, of depression. You know, I mean, uh, even though the patient was screened, it's always important to refer patients uh, to any uh, group so they can socialize. This patient in particular doesn't have a family, and when when we try to talk to patients, uh, and specifically when we are trying to assess the mental health status of a patient, we always need to consider that the patient can have uh, some ideas, you know, and suicide is always a big, big concern. So if if you detect or if you um, see a patient with a social isolation is always, always important, you know, to address this, as Rebecca said. Yeah, and that's a very good point, Jose. Thanks for, for sharing that. Uh, another thing that I, I thought was interesting here is you mentioned your relationship with your colleague who you, you have sort of specialized with over, over the years. Um, and Wendy, uh, are, are you able to share your perspective here as well? I, I see you provided I I would, um, the, Rebecca and I work with, uh, as she said, different patients. I mean, Rebecca is very good with our migrant farm workers and everything and the people that don't speak the language. Um, however, she has strengths that I do not have and vice versa. So we can both communicate to one another and help one another uh, 
determine what some of the social issues are with the client. We form personal relationships with these clients. And sometimes, uh, to my chagrin, I've done that a little too much. But um, we're able to hold their hand. We're able to give them a little bit of a social support in areas where they feel so abandoned and so alone. Uh, we may be the only resource that they have that can help them bridge that fence back into the real world and a, a somewhat safe sense of being. Once they start feeling safer uh, and a little less depressed and a little la less anxious, you'll find some of those numbers coming down with their health and they may be able actually to get off some of their medications. Now, there's another thing, because we work in a poor rural health community, we lack some resources. As Rebecca said, Medicare and Medicaid will help pay for the transportation. But the question is, where do we get transportation? That's a problem that we have all been looking on, looking at for a long time and have not come up with any resources or such to bring that into our personal area. But that can be a problem. There can also be a problem with the, as I said, technical infrastructure. Um, there's not always access to a cell phone or a computer where you can do telehealth. There are not always physicians, physicians that are willing to go do a home visit. That's pretty difficult. But if you can get the client to trust you with just your interactions, sometimes you're able to get that client, as long as you will hold their hand, they will get back to that primary care physician and get back into a regular medical routine where their health and their social determinants can interactively um, go hand in hand and make their lives so much better. And if I if I may add, thank you so much, Wendy and Rebecca, for your response and for your service to your community. Um, it, it, you also make our jobs so much easier um, because when those patients do see CHWs and engage in that sort of counseling, we find that they act, they tend to show up to their appointments more often, and they tend to be easier to talk to and more open to talk to us as physicians. So. Uh, uh, I'd like to crystallize that point as being a good example of how important the interdisciplinary team is. We are all the primary care clinic um, and ensuring that you have good relationships, strength-based relationships with your colleagues um, and different uh, healthcare professionals is so important. And it, it's so good to see that you guys are, are practicing that down, down there in Florida. So thank you for your response. Uh, Fide, if we could um, grab uh, one more response, if possible, please. Yeah, sure. Um, let me see. Okay, Marilyn, then Marilyn, would you like to participate? And sure. Um, so I'm coming from outside the FQHC. Um, and I've been on all four of these um, things and I'm finding them very um, informational. So the most important um, social, I, I work for a center for independent living. They are all over the country and they, our main thing is our focus is to work with people with disabilities and get them the services they need and they make the goals. So it's really consumer oriented and you meet the person where they are and you're all expressing those kinds of things but from a medical standpoint and i agree that the greatest i think the greatest barrier is the depression and then the medical insurance getting them an income this person is actually eligible for social security benefits at 67. he's met his if he wants to continue working till 70 he can do that and get a higher benefit and there's nothing wrong with that. He doesn't even have to go on disability because that ends at age 64 for, for folks. 
uh, from 18 to 64, you're eligible for those benefits. So I'm talking about retirement benefits. So someone should help him apply for that so he can get his income coming in. And that's a real simple thing. He's got a work history, it sounds like. And then depression is a big one, you know, and the loss of job added to that and not being able to pay his bills and all those kinds of things. And those are all things at Centers for Independent Living. We'd like a partnership with doctors. We often, the, the we don't go looking for people. People come to us, they get referred. So um, we do have um, an emergency type of system here in Santa Fe and New Mexico. It's called um, Connect, Santa Fe Connect. And that happened to be, became very, very important during the pandemic because people were losing their jobs. They didn't have money to pay their rent because they had to stay at home. All kinds of things were happening to people. And this became a referral source. We're part of that network. I don't know if you have those kinds of networks in your some of your cities and um, rural areas, but it's good for doctors and medical professionals to know about as many resources as possible. So I would suggest everybody including the community health workers, because we have a lot of rural area in the nine counties in northern New Mexico. New Mexico is a pretty rural state. We have like maybe five big cities and then um, some smaller towns and then a lot of rural area. So these FQHCs that came into a being um, during Obama's administration, I believe, are extremely important on the community health workers and we can be a resource so i would suggest um maybe finding a you know finding one that's near your area that's serving your county and at least finding out how we can be helpful um because we are we help with you know get people that with the social stuff that is not and accompany people to an appointment i've done that somebody's afraid to go to their appointment or they're not sure that somebody will understand them. We don't talk for the person, but we're there and we provide support. Um, that includes dental visits that people are really scared of. And um, yeah, so. Well, thank you so much for that yeah. and, and for your service to your community. Um, yeah. I, 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 the Centers for Inpe Independent Living do incredible work in supporting our patients. And I agree, we, we should work work more closely together to uh, link patients to those resources and to professionals like yourself. Uh, thank you so much for that. Sure, thank you. Um, and uh, Fide, we're, we're, we got about five minutes left. So if I could, uh, I'd like to review some of the uh, additional resources I have for folks here. Um, and I'm gonna go through these quickly, um, but uh, they are uh, available in the slides and they're, uh, as usual, the links are available for anyone who wants to look. Um, <clears throat> and I always put, my um, my recommended framework for CHW based um, uh, coaching in here using intake goal setting follow up engagement navigation coaching basically everything that uh, professionals like Rebecca and Wendy do on a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. And let's talk about STOH screeners. STOH screeners are increasingly used by health centers, and uh, the issue is that. The available STOH screeners often don't have the level of detail required for specific community patient needs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, data from the 2022 Survey of American Physicians indicated that six in 10 physicians have little to no time to address the STOH in the exam room. 89% indicated lacks of staff to address the STOH and SDOH burnout is a real thing. For providers in the exam room, when we don't feel like patients are being taken care of socially, um, it can cause extreme levels of frustration and burnout. And that's a major barrier to both recruitment and retention. Um, there uh, have been studies out of health centers in our network that have showed that even when a CHW is not reimbursable and the uh, health center needs to pay in total for their work that significant increases in retention and uh, and recruitment are experienced and job set of satisfaction from the physician staff just because there's CHWs on staff. Um, I think that data point is very important and sort of emphasizing the importance of the interdisciplinary model 
in taking care of patients and specifically patients with disabilities. Next slide, please. The next three or four slides are studies that I've put in for your reference on the use of SDRH screeners and the alteration of SDRH screeners. And sort of the detail, the, the overarching themes are, <coughs> excuse me, that um, health centers, uh, data supports that health centers should be able to change and alter their screeners, add questions, uh, and uh, add entries that specifically need, meet the needs of their communities. If you're in a rural area with, no tr with serious transportation issues, you may wanna ask more questions regarding transportation. Um, you may wanna ask more questions regarding um, if you have a, a, a abuse or um, human trafficking. You may wanna ask questions related to unique issues in your community. And the data has, specific, has specifically and consistently supported that health centers should add those questions to their SDRH screeners to help network patients to care. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, another one, of course, and next slide. And uh, uh, another study. I, I, I wanted to make it really clear that you guys should be able to do this and give you all the resources. Um, so, uh, it, it, and as far for those of you who don't use the uh, use STRH screeners, uh, the template I, I recommend using is the prepare screening, which is very common and very used very widely by FQHCs. Um, uh, next slide, please. And uh, the WellRx screen, which there is a link on the case study to that. Um, if anyone would like assistance or in the the process of adding questions to an SDOH screener, uh, please send me an email, I'd be happy to help you. Um, so we have a, a couple of minutes left, and I'm happy to stay longer if we have questions. Um, and uh, if we could, uh, we'll open the floor up to, to everyone, if anyone has any questions or concerns. It has been an absolute pleasure teaching this learning collaborative and engaging with all of you. I've learned significantly from your professional experiences and expertise. Um, and uh, as a physician and epidemiologist, I feel uh, happy that, uh, that, that the interdisciplinary model is so supported in our, our various health professionals. So uh, let's continue to work together to keep our patients healthy and safe and improve our communities. Thank, all, thank you all for your uh, cont contributions to that. And I hope to see you in the future in uh, okay. my future sessions and in my colleague Dr. Leon's sessions as well. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Leon. And thank you to all of you that participated again. Um, this is just a kind of reminder to please complete our post-evaluation survey. And in the survey, we have included some questions. If you can just provide your feedback on your and your thoughts about the learning collaborative as a whole, that would be great. Um, and then also, please be on the lookout in your email. In like about 90 days, we're gonna be sending a follow-up email to kind of reevaluate what uh, your progress has been at your health center with another evaluation survey. It's going to be a very short survey, but if you can please fill that out. We're going to be sending it out probably at the beginning of July. Um, so just letting you guys know about that. And that is it for today. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you in our future trainings. This is our contact information. If we have any other questions as well, thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.